you're going to need to buckle up your seatbelts for this one because this passage is very powerful, but sadly, it is often abused. In 1 Corinthians 13, we will be looking at very quickly what true love is. We will be looking at that which is perfect, and we will also be seeing what biblical tongues are. So let's plow ahead and look at this passage. This is the New Testament in 90 days. We'll be looking at lesson number seven, which is 1 Corinthians 13, tongues, love, and that which is perfect. It is so important for us to understand the context. Paul just corrected the Corinthian church for their abuse of spiritual gifts in chapter 12. He also just explained the importance of using their gifts correctly. He is about to make the point that true biblical love is more important than the gifts and above themselves. For gifts will pass, but love will remain. Let's look and see what Paul wrote to this church. He says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. I want you to notice here three overstatements that Paul is making. He is making a simple point that even if you have all giftedness, if you have all spiritual gifts, but have not love, biblical love, what good are those gifts? Look at this. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, he's giving overstatements here. He's saying, though I can speak all languages to men, and even if I was somehow given the ability to speak to angels, but I have not love, it's no good. It's garbage. It's just noise. Look at the second picture. And though I have the gifts of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. Once again, Paul's making overstatements. He didn't know all prophecy. He didn't understand all mysteries. He doesn't have all knowledge. But he's saying, even if I had all of this giftedness but had not love, the results are garbage. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, the ultimate sacrifice, but have not love. It's garbage. What good is it? You know, in today's church, so many people fight because they think they're the most gifted individuals in the world, but they have not love. That's what was happening with the Corinthian church. Incredibly gifted, but they did not use their gifts properly with love. So Paul defines for us what true biblical love is. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. It does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked and thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Look at these two examples of what love is and what love isn't according to the word of God. Love suffers long. Love is kind. Love rejoices in the truth. It seeks the truth and rejoices in it. It bears all things. It believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. But notice what love is not. And this is what the Corinthian church, how they were using their gifts. Love does not envy. You don't look at someone who's more gifted than you and envy them or wish you could be them. No. You love them. You're kind to them. True love does not envy. It does not parade itself. It doesn't say, oh, I'm gifted by God. Let me tell you how gifted I am. No. Love is not puffed up. It doesn't behave rudely. It doesn't seek its own interest. It doesn't provoke others. It doesn't think evil. And it doesn't rejoice in iniquity. Evaluate yourself and how you use your gifts. Love never fails. 
But where there are prophecies, they will fail. Where there are tongues, they will cease. Where there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. It's very interesting as you examine the grammar in this passage. Paul says that tongues will cease, and the grammar he uses shows that they will cease by themselves. Nothing will cause tongues to cease. They will simply cease. Remember, this is talking about the spiritual gift of tongues. I'm not talking about this foolishness that is happening in churches around the globe today. I'm not talking about this babbling, this thing that makes no sense. No, I'm talking about true biblical tongues. The gift to be able to speak a language that you didn't study, haven't practiced, and just be able to speak that language in a way to communicate the Word of God. That is biblical tongues. It's a known language that you yourself don't know, but you're communicating it to somebody else. You see, tongues have ceased. The gift of tongues has ceased. Tongues are only mentioned in the early book of Acts and 1 Corinthians and is not found in any later book. History also records that tongues have ceased. In the 500 years following the death of the apostles, only one radical group claimed to speak in tongues. Remember, we are talking about a spiritual gift, so this should be common. This should be, hey, I can go to France, and if I have the gift, I can just speak French, even though I never studied it. God just gives me the gift, and I can just speak in a language. We don't see that today. We don't see that. Even early in history, the early church fathers even some of them said they didn't see it because it passed away. So-called tongues popped up here and there throughout history. It appeared again in the 1700s by a woman named Anne Lee who viewed herself as the female version of Jesus Christ. The next group to claim to have this gift was the Pentecostals in the early 1900s. These tongues do not resemble biblical tongues. They are more interested in the babbling. They claim they take this passage and twist it so terribly and say, see, Paul says we can speak with the tongues of angels. But that's not at all what this passage is talking about. He's giving overstatements. And he's saying, hey, if you have all of this giftedness that you can know all mysteries, all knowledge, but have not love, what good is it? My friends, tongues have ceased. The gift has ceased. From a, a simple, non-biased view of Scripture and history, it is clear that tongues ceased after the apostolic age. And I'm very concerned for my brothers and sisters in Christ who go and they babble and they speak in these weird things that aren't known languages. I am very concerned for them. Unlike tongues, the grammar Paul uses for prophecy and knowledge shows that they will be abolished. They will be abolished by that which is perfect. But the question is, what is that which is perfect? Some have suggested the New Testament, but that kind of seems thrust upon the Scriptures, no pun intended. It seems like it is something that people have taken and tried to throw it on this passage. It doesn't really follow Paul's reasoning here. What seems to fit this context and what seems very biblical from other passages is that which is perfect is when you are face to face with God in eternity. That is which is perfect. It is perfect knowledge of God in heaven, and there will be no need for gifts at this time. When you're with God, you won't need spiritual gifts anymore. You won't need prophecies. You won't need all knowledge, the gift of knowledge. Why? Because you're with God. This makes perfect sense and fits the context. And notice how Paul explains that. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. Paul is making a very simple point here. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. You see, spiritual gifts were given to help the church mature and become more Christ-like. 
We receive them in a childlike state and use them to grow. Full maturity will not be reached until we are with the Lord. Then we shall have no need for spiritual gifts. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Right now we have a limited knowledge of God. It's like seeing yourself in a mirror in dim light. But this will be replaced when we have full knowledge of God in heaven and see him face to face. Look what Paul says in verse 13. And now abide faith, hope, love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. You see, when we are with Christ in heaven, when we are spending our time with him, we will not need faith. Why do you need faith when you are with God himself? So faith is not needed. Hope is not needed at that point. We will be with our resurrected Lord forever. We do not need hope at that point. However, we will have for eternity love, true and lasting love. This is such a beautiful passage And this brings us to our main points. Spiritual gifts used without love are useless. Spiritual gifts used without love are useless. That's the point Paul is making here. Though you're the most gifted person in the world, but have not biblical love, what good is the giftedness. So how can we take this knowledge and turn it into wisdom? Why did God give you your spiritual gift? To focus on the gift itself? So many people I know are so proud if they have this babbling new tongues. They think they're spiritual because they have this gift. They puff themselves up. They're proud And for those in those churches who don't have this supposed gift, they're like, why hasn't God gifted me? And they become envious, and they start acting like the Corinthian church, which is not a good thing. Why does God give us gifts? To use them for God's glory. God does not give us spiritual gifts so that we can say, look how great I am. God gives us gifts that we may build the church of God. That is why we have our gifts, to build the church and edify the saints. Use your gifts, not for your own glory, but for the glory of God. You do this when you use your gifts with biblical love. One day you're going to stand before God, that which is perfect. When that day comes, you'll see him face to face. And at that time, you will truly understand what real love is. But in the meantime, use your giftedness the way God intended you to use them for his glory and to use them using real biblical love.